Wolverine Spitfire and the Avro Lancaster, arguably the best fighter and the best heavy bomber of World War II. No other two aircraft quite stir the blood in the same way as the Spit and the Lank. Aircraft in which many Australians fought and died. Spitfire was flown not just by Britain and its allies, but by most air forces in the world. 22,000 were built, including 650 for the Royal Australian Air Force. Today, in Australia, there are just two Spitfires still flying. Both owned by the Tamora Aviation Museum in New South Wales. The one with shark's teeth is a Mark 8. This was the last Spitfire to be taken on charge by the Air Force, but it never saw any action and ended up as an instructional airframe at the Sydney Technical College. Unlike the Mark 8, Tamora's other Spitfire saw action at the end of World War II. This Mark 16 is in British markings and served with the RAAF's 453 Squadron in Europe, taking part in ground attack raids in Holland at the end of the war. It was previously owned by Sir Tim Wallace and formed part of the Alpine Fighter Collection at Wanaka in New Zealand. Most Spitfires were built at the enormous Shadow Factory at Castle Bromwich near Birmingham. And this is the man who became known as Mr Spitfire. Alex Henshaw was one of the greatest test pilots of all time and flew one in ten of all Spitfires built. Alex, this ought to be worth watching. Who is Alex? The factory test pilot. He knows how. Oh, he's a Spitfire test pilot. Eh? In 1998, he visited Australia. His host, the legendary Australian pilot, Colin Pay. Beautiful condition. How many hours has this done then? Uh, 200. From new. From new, is it? Oh my God, it should, be, it should be good. It was the last Spitfire to come to Australia in the wartime. Was it? And never, and never, out, never used. Never come out of the box. No, marvellous. Are you using 100 octane in this? Yep. yep. laid on a special display for his famous guest. Everybody thought he was coming into land. Then he slammed the throttle wide open and pulled the aircraft up into a roll with the undercarriage down. What is it today that's so special about the Spitfire? What makes it uh, a special aeroplane, do you think? Well, undoubtedly this symmetry of the aircraft itself, quite apart from its history, and then of course there's the crackle and wine of the, of, of the Merlin and, and, and the Spitfire when it's going. 
at some speed which is so different to any other aircraft. Did you ever think you'd see a day when the Spitfire should, would be so popular again? I mean, it's never ceased to be popular really, has it? Uh, no, uh, I think I thought the same as everyone else, that once the war had finished, that uh, it would become an obsolescent aircraft, gradually go out of use, and that uh, no one would take any further interest in it. But uh, instead of that, I suppose it's more popular now. In fact, I'm not uh, uh, guessing, I'm certain it's far more popular now than it was during the war. Seventy years before, Alex Henshaw was thrilling the crowds with his own brilliant flying displays. Between 1940 and 1945, he test flew more than 2,300 Spitfires and survived a number of serious accidents. Spitfire had been a great success in the defence of Great Britain. But was it the plane for Australia? December 1941 found Australia unprepared, her aerial fighter force negligible. War Cabinet decided that Dr H. V. Everett should go to Washington and London. With Mrs. Everett, he was in Washington in a few days, flying all the way. He attended the first meeting of the Pacific War Council, presided over by President Roosevelt, forthrightly stating Australia's case. In London, Churchill listened to Australia's voice, himself beset by gigantic problems, supplies for Russia, the Middle East. He nevertheless produced aid, including Spitfires, squadrons of them, with pilots and ground crews. Dr. Evert heard the late, great Paddy Finucane say, for Australia you can do no better than Spitfires. And so, as a direct and spectacular result of Evert's mission, Spitfires came to Australia. With them came RAF and RAAF pilots and ground crews. Following them, ample replacements against operational and other losses. A continuous stream of trouble for Tokyo. Britain remembered. I'd just like to say on behalf of the Australian squadrons how very pleased we are to be back again. I hope that the RAF chaps out here will have as good a time as we all had in England. The Spitfire was designed for the defence of Great Britain and could only fly about 600 kilometres. Australia is a big country, so when Northern Australia was attacked by the Japanese, the Spitfire's shortcomings became obvious. And for the first time, the Spitfire came up against an aircraft which could meet it on equal terms, the Mitsubishi Zero. In a dogfight, the idea was to get on the enemy's tail. The Spitfire was so manoeuvrable it could turn inside any aircraft, but not the Zero. American and British designers had always been dismissive of Japanese aircraft, but there was no doubt that the Zero was in a class of its own, light and heavily armed. Mitsubishi also produced the Raiden, codenamed Jack, a big radial engine fighter, the only aircraft capable of flying high enough to bring down a B-29 bomber. The first batch of Spitfires sent out from England had faulty propellers. A great many pilots lost their lives because the propeller overspeeded and the engine blew up. Many other pilots got lost and ran out of petrol. Spitfires, or sea fires, also flew from aircraft carriers. July 1944, off the New South Wales coast, and Australian pilots are landing their sea fires on the British aircraft carrier HMS Indomitable. 
The Seafire was a Spitfire Mark V with an arrestor hook and wings that had to be manually folded. The Spitfire's long nose meant that pilots had to make a curved approach and sideslip the aircraft onto the deck. The batsman, meanwhile, would be working overtime making sure that the pilot was making a safe approach. This aircraft, flown by Sub Lieutenant Charles Bowley, went over the side. Incredibly, he escaped before the aircraft sank and was rescued by a destroyer which was following. The batsman, meanwhile, narrowly missed being struck by the propeller. The Spitfire's narrow undercarriage meant that landings were a series of hops and often the undercarriage collapsed altogether. The Spitfire was in production at the outbreak of the war and it was still being built in 1946. In 10 years, the engine size doubled from 1,000 horsepower in 1936 to more than twice that in 1946. Many other air forces flew the Spitfire, including Russia and the United States. This Spitfire was one of 600 supplied to the US Army Air Force. A few Spitfires were still in frontline service in the Royal Air Force in the 1960s. While the Spitfire is rare in Australia, there are 50 flying throughout the world, more than any time since the 1950s. Duxford in England regularly puts as many as 12 Spitfires in the air at once. This lineup of different marks of spit shows how much the aircraft changed in 10 years. Engines got bigger, noses got longer, and propeller blades went from two to six. They ranged from an early Mark II Spitfire to a dark blue Mark V. Two Mark 9s, one in Dutch markings, and a Mark 16. The pale blue Mark 11 is an extremely rare aircraft and flew on photographic reconnaissance missions over Germany, France, and Holland. The green and orange two-seater is in the colors of the Irish Air Force. Ireland was one of the few countries to train its pilots on a two-seat version of the Mark 9. And there are a couple of Hurricanes, too. Throughout the world, they are rarer than the Spitfire, although one is flying in New Zealand. In the Battle of Britain, the Hurricane shot down more aircraft than the Spitfire. But that's because there were more Hurricanes than Spitfires. It was the job of the Hurricanes to take on the bombers, whereas the Spitfires were to engage the fighters. Even today, people still argue over which was the better aircraft. The Mustang could fly further than the Spitfire or the Hurricane, but when Australia was looking for new aircraft in 1942, it wasn't available. Only later in the war would Australians fly the Merlin-powered version. Another possible contender, the long-range Lockheed Lightning. Like the Mustang, the Lightning was still in the development stage and the performance of the early models was disappointing. So much so, in fact, that the Royal Air Force rejected them. Later, in the Pacific, the Lightning came into its own, but Australia flew very few. After the war, hundreds of Spitfires were scrapped in Australia, 
You could buy one still in its box for £50. But today this is a rich man's toy costing between one and four million dollars. Sector headquarters would contact sector control who would arise that squadron will be scrambled and we'll be doing that in a few At Duxford they relive the Battle of Britain. The flying gear, the uniforms, right down to the 1940s hairstyles. That's right, yeah. Well, so uh, through uh, your... Uh, Throughout the world today, there is something like 50 of these beautiful aircraft still flying. But only one Spitfire is owned and flown by a woman. She lives in England, but she is in fact an Australian. Pleased to meet you. It's a real pleasure, man. Oh, first one my new Carolyn Grace is from Goulburn in New South Wales and is the only woman in the world to own and fly her own Spitfire, a two-seater. The Grace Spitfire was built in 1944 and flew with three French, Polish, Belgian, Norwegian and New Zealand squadrons before being converted as a two-seater for the Irish Air Corps. A number of other women pilots flew it during the war with the Air Transport Auxiliary. Is it still a great thrill to fly that machine? It's a very special aeroplane and it never loses its appeal. Why is it important, Carolyn, to preserve aircraft like the Spitfire? I was talking with a lot of the Battle of Britain veterans and the Battle of Britain Fighter Pilots Association. Their main memory, the main thing that they want is to not be forgotten so that it doesn't happen again. No. And that, I think, is the reason that, that I, I do it in honour of my late husband, Nick, uh, for the memory of him, for our children, to keep the spirit of him alive. We lost the person who didn't want to lose the spirit. Uh, and in strong addition to that is the, the fact that we keep this going uh, in, in memory of all the veterans who fought for us, who are no longer with us, who have lived the remainder of their life with the pain of what they went through, uh, to, so that hopefully the children of the next generation, which is why I did Spitfire Race, will know the story and uh, it will never happen again. Carolyn Grace was introduced to flying by her husband Nick, who was in Australia working as a crop dusting pilot. Nick Grace bought the aircraft in bits and spent five years rebuilding it. It flew again in 1985, and three years later he was killed in a car crash. The man who designed the Spitfire was Reginald Mitchell, who died before the aircraft was to prove itself as a great fighter. Mitchell was already seriously ill with stomach cancer when a name was selected for the new fighter. They were going to call it the Shrew, but they decided on the Spitfire. His son ran into the bedroom and said, Father, guess what they're going to call the new fighter? They're going to call it the Spitfire. Mitchell said, that's just the sort of bloody silly name they would call it. The first aircraft to carry the name Spitfire was an ugly looking thing. It had a fixed undercarriage, a gull wing and an unreliable Rolls-Royce Goshawk engine. It could do 230 miles an hour flat out, not much faster than the biplane fighters then in service. The plane was a flop. Reginald Mitchell went back to the drawing board. What was needed was a new engine, a retractable undercarriage, eight guns and a new wing. A very special wing. The result was the Spitfire, the killer fighter. The Lancaster and the Spitfire were both powered by the same engine the Rolls-Royce Merlin. Like the Spitfire, the Lancaster was developed from an aircraft which was not an immediate success. This was the Avro Manchester, powered by the notoriously unreliable Rolls-Royce Vulture engines, 
pilots, however, liked the way the Manchester flew, but if one engine packed up, which was often, the aircraft couldn't maintain height on the power of one engine. Four out of ten Manchesters were lost on operations. The solution was to give it a longer wing and four engines. Originally, Avro had been denied the use of the Rolls-Royce Merlin because they were earmarked for the Spitfire. The Lancaster very quickly earned a reputation as being a superb heavy bomber, fast, manoeuvrable and with an enormous bomb load. It could carry almost twice as many bombs as the American Flying Fortress. One bomb, the 10,000 kilogram Grand Slam, is still the biggest single bomb to have been dropped from an aircraft. lots of Spitfires flying throughout the world, but there are only two Lancasters. One is in Canada. And the other in England. The cost of maintaining a four-engine bomber is phenomenal, and in England that cost is borne by the Royal Air Force, as the Lancaster is part of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. The Canadian Lancaster, meanwhile, is the property of the Canadian warplane heritage. At East Kirkby in England, there's another Lancaster with Australian connections. It doesn't fly, but it can taxi up and down the runway. This is just Jane. She was built at the end of the war and earmarked for service with the RAF in the Far East. But the war ended and she was sold to the French naval air arm based in New Caledonia to be used for air-sea rescue work. In 1964, Just Jane was flown to Sydney for an extensive overhaul before being ferried back to London. She had a number of owners before being acquired by the Panton brothers, Fred and Harold. The Pantons had a brother, Christopher, who was shot down and killed on a bomber raid over Nuremberg in 1944. East Kirkby was the home of the RAAF's 460 squadron. Many Australians took off from this airfield, never to return. The Panton brothers not only bought the plane, they bought the airfield and the buildings as well. The control tower is authentic World War II, as is the hangar. To cover the cost of maintaining this enormously complex aircraft, taxi rides are made up and down the runway. 100 pounds will get you a ride in a classic bomber. <laughs> 
we used to come and watch the Lancasters taking off here as lads during the war. Uh, what sort of what sort of state was the aircraft in when you finally acquired it? It's pretty good, really. Was it? It was. Yeah. It was up for sale at Blackpool in 1972. We'd been spent several nights outside, you know. It was getting ready for for a bit more care and attention, but the engines had been. You know, looked after and mothballed and inhibited, and they're in good condition. You know, when they came to start the engines in the 90s, everything was free. You know, they just, the engineer took a cover off somewhere and pulled the props round, the pistons went up and down beautifully. So it's not, there's nothing seized up at all. So, uh, and every time we pressed the button to start them, they went, you know, after months of work, of course. <laughs> This this must mean a lot to you. Oh yes, brother. every time you know it. Uh, no matter how often I see the engine start up and rev up, it always gets to me. To anyone who's travelled in a modern airliner, the inside of a Lancaster is unbelievably cramped and claustrophobic. There's barely enough space for two crew to pass each other in the fuselage. The green beam is the wing main spar. You have to climb over it to get to the cockpit. The pilot sits high up in the left hand seat. But there's only one pilot. The other seat is occupied by the flight engineer. Below and in front, the perspex window of the bomb aimer's position. Imagine spending eight hours over Germany in a Lancaster. You're freezing cold, the engines are making you deaf, and you have maybe a 50-50 chance of making it back alive. This is the loneliest the coldest and potentially the most dangerous seat on the aircraft, the rear gunner's position with these four uh, 303 rifle caliber machine guns. The rear gunner, of course, couldn't wear his parachute in this very confined space, so in the event of the aircraft being hit, he would have to open these two doors, go back along the fuselage, retrieve his parachute, put it on, then turn the turret to one side and jump out through that tiny gap. It's hardly surprising that very few of them actually made it. There is, however, no reason why this Lancaster couldn't be made to fly. In fact, on one of its taxi runs last year, it did a small hop into the air from the grass strip. To keep it flying on a regular basis would need an injection of serious amounts of money. So what does Harold Panton think? Well, we're looking at it, you know. It, I'm that's sure. Big money, I mean, isn't it? Yes, it is. But apart from the money, it could be done, you know. Forgetting yeah. about the money, it can be made to fly, you know. No Anything doubt. Anything can be made to fly it, if you've got it, the money. There's no doubt about it, it can be made to fly. Now, having said about this, this abandoning the aircraft, there, there are a few places where you can get out. Uh, none of them very easy. The first one is right at the extreme nose of the aircraft. There's a hatch underneath, but generally the only person that could get out of there would be the, the bomb aimer or the front gunner, uh, because that is a very difficult position to get down into, to get down into where the bomb aimer uh, sits. So generally he'd be the only one to get out of there. The pilots generally would stay with the aircraft until the rest of the crew had abandoned it, because if they left their position then the aircraft would tend to go completely out of control, go into a spin. Three and a half thousand Australians died serving in Bomber Command, most of them on Lancaster. This Lancaster, S for Sugar, is in the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon in London. It flew with the RAAF's 467 squadron. Edgar Childs was a flight engineer and survived 46 missions. I did 46 operational flights on the Lancasters all over Europe, including the French Atlantic ports, the Ruhr, down to Italy, 
and Berlin, Hamburg, Cologne, Stuttgart, Frankfurt, and every time I came back with four engines still running and no casualties on board, thank God. You were one of the lucky ones, weren't you? Unquestionably very lucky. At the time, it was the leading cutting edge of technology, undoubtedly. And it was the most successful bomber of the Second World War. The others were much the same size, but they couldn't carry the same loads. You didn't really see devastation. You saw fires. You saw the biggest uh, firework display you've ever seen. The very last trip that I did was to Munich. And as we were going in to drop our bombs, somebody else put a bomb through the top of a gas holder. Immediately there was a flame and it went up at least to 5,000 feet. There are just two Lancasters in Australia and neither of them can fly. One is G for George in the Australian War Memorial. It now forms part of a realistic sound and light show where the plane appears to be flying on a mission. This aircraft was with 460 Squadron, which flew the most sorties of any Australian bomber squadron and dropped more bombs than any squadron in the whole of Bomber Command. 24,856 tonnes. 460 also had one of the highest loss rates of any squadron in Bomber Command. More than a thousand men died, half of them an Australian. G for Georgie's final raid was an attack on Hitler's mountain retreat at Berchtesgarten on Anzac Day 1945. Later it dropped food to starving Dutch civilians. 460 Squadron was effectively wiped out five times over during its existence. RAF Bomber Command represented only 2% of the RAAF personnel in World War II, but accounted for 23% of the RAAF personnel killed in action. Coningsby, Lincolnshire, is home of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. The big hangar contains the Lancaster, five Spitfires, two Hurricanes, two Chipmunk trainers and a Dakota. All of them are kept in pristine condition. There are regular guided tours and it's possible to see the aircraft being overhauled and serviced. During the summer months, these aircraft appear at air shows the length and breadth of Britain. This, up until a little while ago, I could have told you was the oldest Spitfire still flying today, but unfortunately somebody else has, has rebuilt another one which is uh, slightly older than this one. This is a Mark V Spitfire built in 1941. During the war, it carried an unscheduled passenger, a leading aircraft woman called Margaret Hooten. It was her job to sit on the tail as the aircraft taxied out to its takeoff point. She was still hanging onto the tail when the aircraft took off. holding the elevator, waggling the elevator about, and in fact the pilot said at some stage she had control and at some stage I had control. The pilot was totally unaware that she was there. So he realised that he had a problem, so he got in touch with the control tower, said, I've got a problem, and they said, yes, you've got a problem. But they, they didn't actually tell him what the problem was, because obviously if they had, then he would have gone 
He might, or he may have gone bananas and just thrown the poor lady off. Margaret Hooton survived the ordeal with nothing more than strained tendons in her hands. Tamora's famous Mark 8 Spitfire makes a return visit to Scone, where it was rebuilt in the 1980s. It's flown in for the first public outing of Colpay's Kitty Hawk. And here to see them both fly is Bobby Gibbs, fighter pilot and all-round larrikin. Two aeroplanes here with Gibbs marking on is a bit obscene, isn't it? <laughs> Last time I saw this was in the desert after I'd been shot down and I, I went back to the aeroplanes some time later and the Germans had burnt the damn thing. The only thing intact was the cowling. It is still there. And uh, I, I thought, well, I hope the old Huns took a poor view of it. <laughs> Bobby Gibbs flew the Kitty Hawk in North Africa and the Spitfire in Northern Australia. Both aircraft are decorated in his personal colours. Bobby's insignia, a kangaroo kicking a German dachshund up the backside. The Kitty Hawk was always inferior to the Spitfire. It was slower and not so manoeuvrable, but it was strongly built and with its 6.5 guns, it had excellent hitting power. Many pilots thought it an underrated aircraft. As one American general put it, it was damned by words, but flown to glory. Australians flew the Kitty Hawk and the Spitfire, but in the air together, they're both great looking aircraft. Canada too carried on using the Lancaster after the war and 400 Lancasters were built under license by Victory Aircraft. This one is the Minarski Lancaster, named after a Canadian Victoria Cross winner who died when his aircraft was set on fire by German night fighters. This Lank was pensioned off in 1964 and survived 13 Canadian winters before restoration started in 1977. It took 11 years to get it back in the air. And like the British Lancaster, it's a regular performer at air shows. Spitfire and the Lancaster were not built to last. The attrition rate in wartime was a matter of months, not years. Who could have imagined that 60 years after the end of the Second World War, these remarkable machines would still be flying? <laughs> 
aircraft uh, in the sky. I mean, what did was it Milton said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And of course, when you see the Spitfire, it's always a joy to see it.